So I would very much like to invite Martin. Martin. Martin uh, Grunfeld, who came to uh, present. Thank you so much from sure. Copenhagen, from the University of Copenhagen. Martin is a philosopher and a curator, and he's been working sort of at this intersection of philosophy and, and uh, museum curating for a while. And he started maybe to think about mushrooms. And uh, so he's been working with artistic practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. I'm an Emma. Um, so, in a way, this is slightly different from the three or the previous presentations, but still, we are going underground and we're looking at conservation, but we are also at a museum, so that's sort of different. Now. So, what are museums? So, museums around the globe uh, are usually very focused on conservation practices. So they aim to stabilize objects in authentic states. Sometimes it's designated as their uh, true nature. Museums are seen as the memory banks of the entire conscience, aiming to save the artifacts for the present and the future. Meanwhile, the absolute authors of museums, heritage figures such as fungi, are suppressed as unwelcome metabolizers that threaten our cultural and historical heritage. But what if we instead also treat microbes and their metabolism as promising potentials at museums? So in this talk, I will invite you to travel with me to a strange museum in reverse, the living room at Medical Musang in Copenhagen. So it's a transdisciplinary research and exhibition project where we collaborate across art, conservation, and the humanities to explore how the end of objects can turn into new living beginnings. So in the project, we try to embrace breakdown as a fundamental part of life and collaborated with other organisms to transform this carbon collection into living cardboards. In particular, we drew on Kate de Silly's work uh, and we attempted to develop ways of caring beyond saving that reawaken collections from their metabolic slumber. So to do this, we were looking for organisms that could literally eat and digest our things. And here, mushrooms came to play a crucial role as a metabolic wizard capable of breaking down even the most stubborn substances as Merlin Shilgrave knows. So in the following, I will tell you a bit about our ways of working with funky in the project. First, by uh, introducing two methodological strategies, one interventionist and one non-interventionist, and then secondly, discussing serendipity, unruliness, and the never ending endings of everything, including this project. So, first an example of what we can see the time. The first example is an example of a non-intervention. So it's it's Sarah Valerosha who has developed this artwork in collaboration with the rest of the transdisciplinary group. It's called Archives with a uh, um, yeah, a bracket around the team, so it's all about archives and archives. So what Sarah was doing at the uh, museum was that she was working with our AME collection, and she was essentially doing an archival work, so she was organizing, storing, and so on. But what she found along the way was something like this. So she found uh, moldy uh, audio wheels um, and started asking these questions. So. So what to do now? Should we clean it? Should we save it? Or can we maybe do something more? Can we perhaps find a way to appreciate these organic textures? So gradually her work also turned into an artistic work. Um, and her fascinating photographs exactly place on this question, what is worth preserving? And we can also ask a question, so is it always the artifacts or can we also think about the eco facts growing as part of our collections? So what we did was we wanted to, to uh, exhibit these equal facts and we decided to passively observe them in the living room, letting them be while appreciating their organic textures. Um, and maybe a note on this is that these equal facts also attest to the past of the collection. So they tell us, for example, of the flooding of Copenhagen in 2011. So this method was a method of non-intervention trying to 
to develop that sort of patient act of appreciation. So this can be cont uh, uh, contrasted with our other strategy, which was a lot more active. So we essentially wanted to accelerate the game. Um, and also I call it metabolic thinking, and we can talk more about that concept later. So the idea was that we wanted to actively seek release, regeneration, and recomposition through guided disturbances, speeding up transformations. So the example you see here is called Slow Show, and it was developed by Maria Palmer, the artist on the picture to the right, in collaboration with the rest of the group. Um, so Maria started working uh, with pink oyster mushrooms, um, and at the time we were in COVID lockdown, so it had to be done at home. And what she did was she cultivated pink oyster mushrooms in discarded medical books from the museum. And then we placed it all together in this installation, which consisted of various objects that were discarded and supposed to be destructed. Um, so part of this is also to look at it and, and it, while the transformations may seem drastic or dramatic, they are also slow, it's called slow show, right? So what we wanted to do was to find a way to explore these transformation processes. And what we came up with was uh, a strategy around trying to record these uh, changes. So Maria used specifically designed uh, just around French microphones to try to capture um, the decomposition of the mushrooms. And I can add to this that uh, drawing on Stephen Grimreich, uh, sounding can be seen as a method for exploring things without clear limits or whose limits has been obscured, like we've just, we've just done there. So for us, sound became a method for listening in on the tiny inaudible sounds of entanglement, growth, and decomposition, and try to establish resonances between objects and organisms, including ourselves. So in this strategy, it was almost like the decomposers became composers. So while the two examples so far brought out some sort of clearly nicely laid out methodological distinction, uh, working with living organisms is not that often that clear. Uh, and that's always the risk that you end up with sticky, messy, potentially toxic installations. And we learned this from another installation, Wendom. So Wendom was uh, made by myself in collaboration with the artist Eduardo Advances and conservator Amelia Schubert. Um, and in the installation, we invited another, it's about a wizard into the museum, Waxworms. So some of you probably heard of them. So they recently became quite famous because they can actually break down soft plastic materials. So uh, originally the installation uh, was made of waxworms, uh, plastics from a metabolic research lab, various medical objects and analog sensors to capture their movements and turn them into sound. Um, so essentially we wanted to transform their eating, digesting, excreting into sound art. Um, so from the outset, the idea wasn't to use mushrooms in this installation, but as we shall see, things are not that simple. Um, so after a few months running the experiment, the worms started dying. Um, and that's hardly surprising, right? So so at the and meanwhile, the bottom, I don't know how well you can see it, but the bottom of the installation started becoming blackish and moldy, and it was a real mess. Lucky for us, it was seen. Um, so looking from the outside and in, um, we found comfort knowing that what appeared as a death chamber for the worms also turned into compost. Or as Michael Marl notes, uh, rotting both makes possible and invariably succeeds growth. Finitude is the ever-present shadow and source of nourishment for existence. Then on a random Friday uh, morning, Eduardo and I first noticed what looked like grayish, brownish debris outside the installation, outside. Um, and later I brought a microscope and I tried to figure out what it is, and it turned out actually to be these guys. So these lively organisms, sugar mice, that emerged within the installation and actually also made it out of a seed installation and into the museum space. Obviously, our conservator wasn't very happy, and I was at the same time quite uh, excited. <laughs> um, so new uninvited life forms emerge within and around 
that close habits of confusing our distinction between intervention and non intervention strategies, and also highlighting the unstable temporalities and uncertain futures of our experiment, experiments. So, are we facing a sort of a never ending experiment, perhaps? In a sense, never ending indeed. Um, as we several months later decided to revisit the experiment together with archaeologist Tim Brossatsen to excavate it and document it in film. So what we found inside the installation was all these objects that were entangled in different ways and had all sorts of interesting growths on them. For example, the metal looked like it had been on the bottom of the ocean for quite a while. Um, but what I found particularly interesting was exactly going into the bottom of the installation and trying to figure out what is actually that black moldy kind of thing. And at the time, it seemed like some sort of, sort of soil, but seemed very smelly and very sour, and also with pieces of glass because we had to break it to get in. Actually, um, so I brought that sample back to my freezer first, and then took it to a um, uh, scientist, Jakob Blesvier Hof, who could help me identify it as A. glaucus, A. Aspergillus glaucus. I don't know how to say that in English. Um, um, and this once again emphasized that decomposition does not necessarily entail loss, right? Which was sort of a starting point. You can see the culture on the right. Um, so the exhibition closed this summer, and we were actually left in quite a sticky situation because now that they try to turn these slow endings in the uh, museum objects into new living beginnings. How then can we let the resulting art, artworks and organisms end? And what comes after such endings? So when I'm thinking about these ending and endings, I'm thinking endings not at a finite point, but as a much longer process of accumulation and exchange and excess of things existing, persisting outside of a limited time frame, human-centered perspective and funding schemes. So while the living room is now closed, and the project has officially ended. Many of the objects are still remaining as material questions for our methods. All of these objects, for example, what should we do with them now? Um, so to deal with our disposal issues at the museum, we need to do more than place break down. Um, we need to try to learn ways of actually trying to practice it. Um, at the same time, the slowness even of accelerated decay as a method relying on tiny agencies of other organisms uh, leaves us in a situation where longevity poses a problem as processes of breakdown are simply too slow to deal with the accumulation of objects. So in this respect, I want to end with a more hopeful example of compostability. So these sculptures are called Daphne, and they are three mycelium printed sculptures made of king trumpet and reshi. Um, and they're developed in collaboration with the Digital Materialities Group at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts at the University of Copenhagen. Um, they have been in the living room for almost a year, um, but are now in a phase of composting themselves in the yard of the medical science. So while the exhibition closed, we were allowed to bring these outside and, and let them gradually turn into soil. So what they show us is that there perhaps are other ways to keep living as they gradually decompose returning to soil. But while these sculptures show us a path for release and regeneration, the remains of the living room will endure and exchange with the surroundings as a non-finite and potentially toxic excess. So I want to thank you for listening and I want to take uh, thank also this huge rich list of contributors that I've tried to uh, list chronologically, but obviously forgotten someone along the way. Um, and I also want to, so the project cl uh, closed and we have a lot of traces left and one of them is these postcards. So I want to share them with you and circulate. So please take them, bring them into the world, distribute them as, as you like. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs>